Good morning. morning. Welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all our members, friends, and guests. My name is George Shearer, and I'm a member of your board of trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. Today's service is led by Reverend Gordon Bailey and members of the Neighborhood People of Color Group with music by music director Dr. Zaneda Robles and associate music director Wells Ling together with the Neighborhood Chorus. Please take a moment to silence your phones and other devices as we begin our service. Families with young children are always welcome here in the sanctuary and there is additional seating in the entry foyer or the narthex. This morning, I do have two brief announcements. First of all, please join us today after the service at our annual Juneteenth barbecue. Everyone is invited. There's no charge, but donations to offset the cost of future Juneteenth celebrations will be gratefully accepted. On Sunday, June 23rd, that's next Sunday, we will be viewing the live streamed national worship service from this year's General Assembly. A link will be shown in the newsletter so people can watch from home. We will have limited seating here in the chapel to watch the service, but there will be no child care or other services uh, here at Neighborhood Church that morning. More extensive announcements as well as our order of service this morning are available as a link in the Sunday email. Our order of service is also visible online by scanning the QR code on the back of your hymnal with your phone camera. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. And now, Gail Shand. Thank you, George. Good morning, Neighborhood Church. Happy Juneteenth and happy Father's Day. Uh, My name is Gail Shand, and I have the pleasure of introducing our guest minister today, Reverend Gordon Clay Bailey. He's the proud grandnephew of the first black Unitarian minister, Ethel Red Brown. In 1905, Reverend Bailey came here to Neighborhood Church, where being in service in the community is where he answered his call to serve. And July 1st marks his 30th year serving the the denomination. And now ministers... (laughs) And he now ministers at Sepulveda UU. And we welcome Reverend Gordon Bailey back to our pulpit for this Juneteenth Sunday. Thank you. This land and labor acknowledgement was written by Dr. Melina Abdullah, co-founder of the LA chapter of Black Lives Matter, the first chapter of the movement and director of Black Lives Matter Grassroots. Dr. Abdullah is professor and former chair of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA, and she spoke at our church's 2018 Juneteenth service. Land and Labor and Life Acknowledgement. Breathe. This land that we inhabit is physically situated in the original ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. We pay respect to the Tongva and all indigenous people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout their historical diaspora. Breathe. We pay homage to those who were stolen from Africa, placed in bondage, falsely named as chattel, and forced into labor, who were called slaves but never submitted as such. We have always been fully human with an unbroken connection to the divine and to each other. We honor our African ancestors for the still unpaid labor which built what is now the Americas. Breathe. To both our indigenous and African forebears, we commit to the continued struggle for liberation and reparations, for it is only through freedom and justice that we truly give honor. Ashe.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, that system is powerful. No projection needed for me today. <laughs> Hear these words of chalice lighting. They come to us in two ways, partly because Langston Hughes remains this iconic figure for me and my family. He was my father's roommate at Lincoln University. Oh. Uncle Langston always is in my heart. And because we have to light the chalice, that's the way we do things in Unitarian Universalism. Isn't that right? Yeah. All right. So hear these words, and somebody's going to light. Am I doing the lighting? Oh, I can get, can I get a little help? All right, here comes some help. So hear these words. We light this chalice, flame of justice, fire of commitment, symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. Let this land be a place of opportunity that is real and life is free and all the people of, Me of America are truly one. Blessed be. number 1040 in your teal hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing Hush.
Good morning, everyone. That was one of my favorite hymns growing up in a Baptist church, and it reminds me of my dad. <laughs> so we're here to talk about, Lyman and I are here to talk about a brief history of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, the Civil War broke out in 1891, and Lincoln's main concern was keeping the Union together. So how did the Emancipation Proclamation play a part in this? Well, historians think there were three main reasons. One was he thought that enslaved people in the Confederacy would weaken their war effort by reducing their labor force so that the slaves wouldn't be fighting on the Confederate side. And also that these newly freed people would join the Union Army. Second, he wanted to prevent England and France from giving military and political recognition to the Confederacy, although many people in Europe were against slavery. And third, maybe more important, was that he thought it was a moral necessity. And some of this is disputed, but from everything I've read, he really did believe it. Even though faced with considerable resistance from his cabinet, Many people in the cabinet just felt this was much too radical. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, to be effective immediately. However, it could only be enforced in states that had succeeded for the Union. In other words, states in the Confederacy were slave, but there were some states who were not in the Confederacy, but they were still safe slave states and these are called the border states. The border states at that time were Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and after 1863, West Virginia. Now the reason he didn't free these states, he really didn't want them to succeed from the Union because he felt he needed their support. But Texas was the last standing and the most remote state in the Confederacy and it took time to spread the word, and because Texas was under Confederate control, the government was also able to just withhold information to make sure that didn't get spread. But Major General Gordon Granger led about 2,000 Union troops into Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865. And there were approximately 250,000 slaves in Texas at that time. And this is how the proclamation read. All persons held as slaves are and henceforth shall be free. The free men are advised to remain quietly in their present homes and work for wages. They will not be allowed to crowd at military posts and will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. <laughs> anyway, um, so some of the slaves did free Texas and join their family in other parts of the country, but many of them stayed there and worked in servitude jobs such as sharecroppers. Some say Lincoln considered the Emancipation Proclamation to be his crowning achievement. He's quoted as saying, I never in my life felt more certain that I was doing the right thing than I do in signing this paper. If my name ever goes into history, it will be for this act, and my whole soul is in it. The border Union states, uh, Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Kentucky, and uh, Missouri were exempted by, from the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. Also, uh, it's not fully known, always known, only 10 of the 11 seceding states uh, were affected by the Emancipation Proclamation. Tennessee, because it was under Union control in 18, by 1863, uh, was exempted. So uh, we have five states uh, 
where the proclamation did not have effect. Uh, and that was part of Lincoln's um, strategy. They, 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 it can be viewed as, as the uh, uh, strategy, a, a political strategy to save, uh, uh, maintain support for the Union. So um, he didn't want to offend or upset the people in, in the controlled areas uh, where slavery was permitted. Those four border states and, and even Tennessee, which was, which was uh, under Union control by 1863. Also, the, um, the emancipation, uh, uh, following, shortly following the Emancipation Proclamation within a matter of months, the War Department uh, established the U.S. Colored Troops, USCT, that uh, encouraged and, and allowed former slaves in those slave states, uh, in rebel so-called rebellious states of the Confederacy, to uh, join and participate in the war effort as the uh, United States Colored Troops. Um, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution was passed uh, in Congress in January of 1865, before the end of the war, actually, uh, but without any participation, so without participation of the Confederate uh, slaveholding states. The ratification, though, uh, began shortly after that, and with a required three quarters, three fourths of the uh, states giving po positive approval. The ratification process uh, included those rebe rebellious states, but there was a, an approval vote uh, condition of condition on those states for readmittance to the union. So they had those 11 votes right off. At any rate, by the end of 1865, the, uh, the amendment was, which had been ratified, uh, which had been uh, passed, was ratified, and making the uh, abolition of slavery and the uh, emancipation of slaves the law of the land and making official the message that was delivered on June 10th in, uh, in Texas. Uh, just a couple other notes. Texas was the first state to legally recognize Juneteenth as a holiday in 18, 1980, and uh, interest in Juneteenth became more prominent uh, with the killings of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor in 2020. And on June 17, 2021, President Biden signed a bill to make Juneteenth a national holiday. And that's what we're celebrating here today. Thank you. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of our contributions to 501c3 organizations or to neighborhood church-based social justice activities that are making a difference in our community and in the world. Each selected guest organization aligns with our community's mission and values and is nominated by church members who often are longtime volunteers and supporters of these change-making organizations. You can donate today in one of two ways. You can use your cell phone to donate by texting the number on the screen, or if you prefer to donate in person, you can put your donation in one of the three designated boxes during the music or after the service. There's a donation box here, one in the back behind, in the, behind the middle row, and one out in the narthex. Please extend help to those near you who may need assistance reaching a donation box. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or to contribute to church operations, 
please make a note in the subject line of your envelope or use an envelope available at the donation boxes. This week, our gifts will support DRUM, the diverse and revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries. Here to tell us more is Ben Lopez. Good morning. I'm Ben Lopez. I'm a member of the Neighborhood People of Color group, and I have dreams. Yeah, I know someone else also said that some time ago, but I still have dreams, and I know you all have dreams too. In my dreams, locksmiths and security guards are scrounging for work. Wives of generals hold bake sales to pay for their weapons while schools have the funds that they need. <laughs> Food banks no longer have a purpose and collectives like DRUM are winding down having accomplished their mission. Yet dreams remain dreams unless we also take action. DRUM, as George said, stands for Diverse and Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministers, Ministries. And if you break that, that's a long word. Uh, if you break that long name down word for word, you get a clear description of what they do. It is the oldest and largest Unitarian Universalist people of color ministry and anti-racist community organization based in North America. It began in 1997 as a professional group for African-American UU ministers, then expanded to all UU ministers of color, and in 1989, 1999 opened up to all black, indigenous, and other people of color within Unitarian Universalism, lay and professional. Neighborhood church members have been actively involved in DRUM as event participants, organizers, and board members. Our own Neighborhood People of Color group, created in 2005, is considered the oldest chapter of DRUM. DRUM is led by a dedicated group of volunteers and several part-time staff who serve to bring together black, indigenous, and other people of color in meaningful ways, engage and empower new leadership and members help in the development of groups to address issues of systemic inequality and work to fulfill the journey toward wholeness resolution on becoming an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural UUA. DRUM helps it make it possible for black and indigenous, and, uh, indigenous and other people of color to fully experience what Unitarian Universalism has to offer and to be present and active across member congregations. In short, they do a lot of good work. Your contributions to DRUM will assist in supporting ministry and chaplaincy to people of color across the denomination, sponsoring and participating in regional and national gatherings, assisting youth of color to attend denominational and regional events, and supporting families of color and multiracial families in connecting with each other. Registration, information, and videos for past and upcoming events can be found on the website drum.org. Thank you for your generous contributions to DRUM, and happy Father's Day to you fathers, and happy Juneteenth to all. Thank you for giving generously.
I have grown so unaccustomed to hearing beautiful music within a Unitarian Universalist context. L let's be clear, out of the thousand plus congregations, maybe about 200 of them get music right. Thank you. And when you've been around 30 years, I could tell you, I, I, I've been there, I've heard it. <laughs> All right, so two things here. I've got a reading, a piece of poetry that I found quite amazing and spectacular. I didn't know I was going to do it, but there's always some flexible space, right? Yeah, yeah, listen, if you're dealing with colored folks, you better leave some flexibility. <laughs> We don't do the uptight thing. Huh, you feel me? All right now, so this is entitled What Freedom Means to Me, and it's by a fabulous young black woman, Adrienne Prather. Dare I put my words on her, her language, but here it goes. Freedom, oh how long, oh how long I, hmm? Freedom, oh, how I long to be free, truly free. Free in my mind, heart, and soul. I want to truly live in this world and experience the lift every voice and sing. I want to live in a world where that kind of, that kind of feeling screams out liberty. You know the one that Dr. King spoke about and desired that kind of free? The without guilt, condemnation, and non-judgmental kind of free? But when we open our eyes, what do we truly see? Are we soaring above the clouds without fear? Not afraid to speak our truth free? boastfully living out our destiny free, freedom that is not afraid to stand, advocate, speak out for what is right free, freedom that is bold, courageous, and fearless, who speaks for the voiceless kind of free, walking together in unity kind of free, freedom that professes and declares I am free, the I am bold, unique, and fearfully, and wonderfully made type of free. Emancipated, but still, are we free? When the mind is shackled and the pain lingers from the past, are we truly free at last? So many people have died, suffered, been persecuted, wrongfully accused, abused, and misused in this so-called land of the free. Many desired and longed to achieve the American dream. There's nothing wrong with achieving, succeeding, and believing, but this notion is somewhat deceiving. I crave for freedom to walk in our skin free, not being afraid to live and walk down the street unharmed kind of free. Freedom not to be judged by the color of our skin free. Freedom to make sound decisions without fearing for life type of free. Out of the ashes, molded by clay type of freedom that rises and pushes beyond all obstacles, barriers, and distractions that stand in our way. I am living life and uplifting our brothers and sisters type of free. The freedom that breaks barriers and provided opportunities type of free. Freedom is more than just a word to me. Embracing life head on, using the mouth to speak life free, letting go of negativity and to be elevated free, to speak on our mountains and watch it move, seeing the power of our positive words manifest into action kind of free, holding out our hands to help the next woman and man type of free. I am not afraid to speak from my heart and heal from this pain type of free. 
the uncuffing of my hands, getting beyond the cell type of free, to walk as a free woman and a man and given, given another chance, being kind of chain free, step by step, day by day, piece by piece, minute by minute, the march to freedom is within reach by changing our speech and going beyond what is seen, giving others our shoulders to lean on so they can be free. It is not a quick fix like throwing snacks in a bowl, checks mix, but with faith and determination to win and with the confidence from within, in your hearts and in your minds and in your soul, you can scream at the top of your lungs without remorse, guilt, or shame that indeed, indeed, the voice of freedom and on the journey to be in every area of your life is what freedom means to me. I wouldn't have had to write my sermon had I found this first. My girlfriend is talking about something deep and profound. Can you quiet yourselves for a moment so we can go into a bit of reflection, meditation, and my spoken prayer? Let's go there. Gracious spirit of life and love, we thank you for this day. We gather in the presence of the universal energy source of life. We are indebted to our ancestors who persevered great hardships. We, as a human family, recognize the need and call for justice. For those of us who love liberty and the liberation of all, we are in unity today. We gather again to celebrate freedom from our oppression and the full humanity of every man, woman, and child. We gather to celebrate the resilience and contributions of black Americans and all peoples who have pledged themselves to the continued work to build a more just society. We gather to pray and to meditate and to sit in the silence for a moment. Let us sit in silence for a moment. The prophet Isaiah tells us the spirit of God is on the one who proclaims good news to the poor, that binds up the brokenhearted and proclaims freedom to the captives. As we ponder the words that proclaimed freedom to the slaves still had held captive in Texas in 1865, let us commit to work for justice and be champions of peace. Peace for all. May we all accept the call to be bearers of a justice-seeking world. May we all be givers of namaste and love. Blessed be. Amen. Wow. We got some more music. Yay. Yay. This song is called Peace on Earth. It's by Rochelle Farrell. And it goes like this. How can we have peace in the Middle East when there's none at home? How can we have understanding in the land when there's none in the woman and there's none in the man? How can we If we cannot heal our own, and where does this peace on earth begin if not in your home? 
Where do we go now? Do we let the devil win? Or do we get up and fight? Surely we know how to conquer our fear, bring an end to the violence, bring an end to the tears. How can we heal the wounds of the world if we cannot heal our own? And where does this peace begin if not in your home now there's too much talk about it and too many walk without it tell me where is the love where is the God in your life? To my left, a woman abused her child. And to my right, somebody's beating their wives. Tell me, where is the love? Where is the God in your life? How can we heal the wounds of the world if we cannot heal our own? And where does this peace on earth begin, if not in your home? How can we heal all the wounds of the world if we cannot heal our own? And where does this peace on earth begin, if not in your I knew the music was good, but whoa. <laughs> Let me tell you, I got tears in my eyes. Oh no, I come prepared. <laughs> see, 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 29 years in this here ministry and 10 years of cancer survivor. Let me tell you, I have cried me a river. <laughs> and I'm a man who cries. I'm not ashamed. Hey, you know. I write too much, and so I've got to cut this down. But I just wanted to start where I was. It's so funny. You know, last time I was here, your, your, your intern was getting ordained. And you know, I'm a Jamaican, so let's keep it real. I shot the sheriff was on my mind almost every day since I was here. But I swear to you, me no shoot the deputy. <laughs> but the truth of this situation is, Bob Marley says some words in that song that have resonated in my heart since I was a young boy and heard that song the first time. And it wasn't Bob singing it, it was, um, who's? Eric Clapton, who's, who's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame three times. I think he's the only three-time inductee, so Clapton is something special. But Bob says in that song, freedom came my way one day. That's the very language that I've been searching for for my life ever since I heard him sing it. Freedom from my parents, freedom from the police, because in New York City and in Harlem, they used to do us dirty, and I mean do us dirty. Sister Kendall knows she was there in Harlem. 
Washington Heights. Freedom, it's what's been on my mind since I was a boy. It's the only thing that matters to me. I love my wife, Lisa. I love my family, Jackie, my cousin's here. I love my friends, Adrian and her family so much. I love y'all, because this is where I got started with the vision of Unitarian Universalist ministry in this very congregation. And your minister long ago wrote a letter to Boston saying, I think he's of sound mind. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't really know me, but he wrote it in the letter. Because if you knew I was seeking freedom, you wouldn't tell a black man, and yes, I'm a black man that lost his color when I joined up with you all white folks. <laughs> facts. These are facts. Kendall, testify. I was a nice Negro. Come, come up into the White House and turn white. These are true words. I tell you no lies. But that language, freedom, came my way one day, and I've been striving, pushing, scratching, clawing, kicking, screaming, because sometimes my voice doesn't lift up and sing. It lifts up and rages, because I've been an angry black man, angry at the things we've had to endure in this life, in my own country in my homeland, treated like I'm an outcast, beaten and abused by law enforcement. You see, so this, this freedom thing, it means everything for me. So let me read you some of what I wrote. Juneteenth for times like these. It's a funny thing. The state of black America has never been in the best of times like it is, my goodness. Byron Allen, is he a billionaire? How many black billionaires are there? The Grio, any of you watch it? Ask your TV provider to give you the Grio. I like that Grio station. If you didn't see the Grio Awards, look at some black excellence on those Grio Awards. But things are happening for black folks that we never even imagined just a short time ago. My God, can you believe it? Obama is past tense. He came, he went. And so where are we now? Freedom. All right. I better, y'all know, y'all know our girl, black, queer, Afro-Latina, presidente of the Unitarian Universalism, right? So progress. And the Unitarian Universalist Association is on the cutting edge of progress in many ways. Yet we remain the whitest of associations or denominations. You all stick out like a sore thumb. You got people of color. You got a drum group. Here, let me toot my own horn. I gave the name drum to drum. Keep it, keep it 100%. I'm the one that gave the name because every ethnic group on the planet has percussion. So I said, drum, that's the great name for us. Every group got percussion. All right. All right, so Unitarian Universalism. I believe it is a freedom manifesto inherent in the language, in the songs, in the vision that we have for a spirituality or religiosity free from boundaries, free of color, free of gender, free of orientation. Freedom comes within Unitarian Universalism if and when you're ready to grab it to insist upon it, to kick, to rage if need be. I ain't gonna hush. I'm gonna say it out loud. All right, freedom. Freedom is at the center of the black struggle. The, sta the strange career of Jim Crow, the, str the strange careers of Jim Crow North, mm, the North is whoo, just as bad if not worse, and the new Jim Crow examines or brings to light the diversity of the ways that black people in the United States have had their freedom denied. The black struggle for freedom in America writ large is over 400 years old. Heck, it's older than that because just south of the border here in Yanga, Mexico, you have the first free black community in all North America, Jasper Yanga. 
an African who fought the Spanish tooth and nail and was given land and freedom and said, leave us white folks alone, Yanga, stay over there. So if you go to Veracruz and venture outside the city, you can see a statue of Jasper Yanga. Freedom, 500 years in the making. Hear these words of Angela Davis. She says, black history, whether here in North America or in Africa or in Europe, has always been infused with a spirit of resistance, an activist spirit of protest and transformation. The resistance and the protest of which Davis speaks is because of our lack of freedom. And Drum was in response to Unitarian Universalism not seeing people of color. You understand? It didn't just come by happenstance. We black ministers, I was there at that meeting. I was full black back then. <laughs> Y'all be laughing. You know how painful this is to me? We need to get a GoFundMe page to get Gordon his melanin back. <laughs> This is rough going from a beautiful brown to this pink thing. Anyway, <laughs> the need and the necessity for there to be an African American Ministers Association because our white colleagues, not all, but some didn't understand the plight of being a black minister in the association. The reason for drum was because we knew as black folks who have been with UUs for a long time, right? The Universalists had the first black minister, Joseph Jordan, down in Virginia in the 1860s. And my relative, Egbert Ethelred Brown, becomes the first black Unitarian minister in 1912. Universalists was running circles around us. They had it right. Unitarians were slow. They think they're the smartest things in the world. My Jewish friends and my Episcopalian friends score higher on standardized tests than we Unitarians. <laughs> Hear these words of James Cone. He says, liberation is not a theoretical proposition to be debated in a, in a philosophy or theology seminar. It is a historical reality born in the struggle for freedom in which an oppressed people recognized that they were not created to be seized, bartered, deeded, and auctioned. To understand the question of liberation, we need only hear the words, the experience, the mood, and the encounter the passion of those who have to deal with the dialectic of freedom and oppression in the concreteness of this everyday existence. See, to be black in America is to be both part of something amazing and to be under something hideous. The profundity of that has stressed me to the nth degree. Black folks' life expectancy is less. Black folks suffer at a higher rate of a whole host of health issues. See, freedom coming my way one day is my dream of being free of the linked oppressions that have had a foot on my back all my life. And some might say, my friend might say, but what, you lived in that brownstone? You had lawyer parents? I'm the fifth generation college educated person from my Jamaican ancestry? And yes, all that didn't save me from white supremacy. No matter how hard I strove and tried to get away from it, it caught up with me everywhere I went. I was serving a congregation in Durham, North Carolina, some 12 or 13, oh, longer, 15 years ago. And I wanted to show my then lady friend, I don't like girlfriend, I don't date girls, I date grown ass women, excuse my language. <laughs> my lady friend. I took Lisa down to Durham, and everywhere we went in Durham, North Carolina, because I was still kind of black then, the fading had started, but you could tell I was a Negro. 
People were staring at us. In restaurants, people didn't deliver our food at the same time or didn't deliver it at all. We had a hideous experience. I wanted to live in Carolina because I had heard what James Taylor said. In my mind, I'm gone, right? I was going to Carolina my whole life. And we had the best oysters I ever had in Raleigh. I couldn't believe it. I said, what? Did we, they plucked these today. Hush puppies and oysters and good craft beer. Good life in North Kakalaki. But it wasn't meant to be for us because racism, white supremacy, the Civil War still being fought in North Carolina. You understand? So this, this, this notion of freedom as a concept, it is an abstract idea or notion or thought where one's individual and collective existence and humanity is respected. That's all I've been searching for. Let me say it to you again. The notion, the thought, where one's individual and collective existence and humanity is respected. I don't have to explain myself to a damn soul. I am because I am. Gordon didn't owe anybody in this life anything but common courtesy, which we all deserve to give to one another. They call it common. It's not so common anymore. But we've lost much, we've gained much, and we're still stuck with America's original sin. What we did to the indigenous people, the Tongva people of this region, what we did to the indigenous people everywhere in the Americas, what we've done to Africans, what we've done to everyone that wasn't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male. So that means all the white women who were getting done in by white men. Y'all want to be mad at somebody? Look at your male relatives. Yeah, that's right. Say amen to that, brother. <laughs> that's right. That's who's been doing us in. And this isn't an attack or an assault on white malehood. If you come to my house, you'll see my father's father's portrait is hanging in my room. My old grandpappy was a white man in Louisiana. He wasn't really, he had a touch of the tar, but he looked like a white man. He lived like a white man. See, these are the facts, huh? Did you ever meet him, Jackie? <laughs> anyway, listen. The humanity of African people and their descendants who have been disrespected, who have been given a lack of dignity, who have suffered every kind of injustice, that's the reality of this American experiment. The American experiment. We're still, we're still trying to figure this out. See, Marjorie Bowens Wheatley has that piece where she says, if I am black and you are, it doesn't matter. If I am gay and you are, it doesn't matter. If I am um, um, a Republican and you are, it doesn't matter. But we haven't gotten there yet. We're stuck in this conundrum of not being able to see each other clearly. Not being, I like the term woke, some people don't, but we're not being educated the same way so we understand the same histories, the same narratives of the multiplicity of peoples who have come to build something new and amazing in this experiment called the United States. Something's gone awry. We got off track. Lincoln, as wonderful as he is, made statements to the effect if he could, you know, um, save the Union without freeing the slaves, he would have. Now, he moved philosophically from the beginning of that war to the time when they took his life. 
when Wilkes Booth took his life, right? He changed. Those conversations with Frederick Douglass and other, oh, and you know his name is Frederick Bailey. I think he's my relative. <laughs> For real, Douglass he took on as a runaway. But the facts are that he changed. And Lincoln's considered our greatest president, not by all. I think it's FDR, really. And FDR's got issues, too. But he had to grow, just like our association has had to grow. And celebrating Juneteenth, having drum, having Aum, having Luna, having the various groups of people who don't fit the box of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, my family was on the Mayflower, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to be that to be a UU, but I need you to be open to grow and hear and understand that black pioneers in a white denomination got a chapter on my relative Egbert Ethel Red Brown. You white folks need to read it if you haven't read it already. You need to know the journey that we've been on. You need to know us so you can really be our friends, be our allies, be in syncopation with your siblings in this Unitarian Universalist experiment of philosophy, theology, and community building. So join with me in this, in this task, in this work. See, freedom will come for all of us when everyone's free, and none of us will be free until that day when every single one of us, my deaf daughter, my, my Latino stepson, my white wife, who chose to marry a funny Jamaican losing his color. What a brave soul. She married the illustrated man. I don't know what she was thinking. <laughs> Join me and let's push the envelope. Let's push Unitarian Universalism to truly be the guiding star for this nation of ours. Amen? Amen. 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 Closing hymn is number 149 in your gray hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing, lift every voice and sing. Ooh, my faith.
be seated and thank you once again. Woo! Who knew all the way here in Southern California y'all could handle the Black National Anthem? Lordy, Lordy, what I didn't know. Hear these closing words? They're mine. If we begin to gather strength from the teachings of the past and the learnings of this present moment, we begin to move closer to our real reason for being here. The reason for life, I believe, is that we leave this world a better place than when we came into it. Freedom requires an ability to see beyond the confines of nationalism, race, class, creed, gender, orientation, heck, all of those linked oppressions. Please don't let these things separate us. Our DNA, our construction, we're all made of the same space dust. It doesn't matter how it's put together, flower or any of us. Find your way to being that change agent that this world needs. Go forth with peace, go forth with love, go forth with justice on your mind, amen. This prayer was read at a meeting of the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Working at the intersection of spirituality and social movements, this organization defends the humanity of the incarcerated and immigrants, especially those being held in detention centers. Among several current initiatives, they are supporting California legislation to end involuntary servitude of the incarcerated yeah. Who, who are forced to work for pennies in California prisons. <clears throat> Please see Donna Perkins on the patio to find out more and sign a letter, a letter in support of this legislation. Prayer for the marginalized and overlooked people. Holy One, may your realm of love come for the insignificant, unremarkable, overlooked people of the world, for the unnoticed and simple, ordinary people backwater sort of people who appear not to make much impact. For them, may your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come. Holy One, may your realm of love come for those who are lost, who have disappeared or who are missing, for the alienated, uprooted, exiled, and enslaved. Lost rights sort of people who will seldom be seen or be heard of, for them, May your, May your kingdom, kingdom come. Holy One, may your realm of love come for the fearful, the terrorized, and the abused people of the world, those who are unjustly imprisoned or entrapped, voiceless people who will hardly dare to seek help for them May your kingdom come. Holy One, may your realm of love come for the subjugated, silenced, and subdued people of the world, for the lonely, the lacking, the faded, the frightened, shadowy people unable to bring attention to their suffering. For them, may your kingdom come. Holy One, may your realm of love come for the people with disabilities in the world, for the poorly educated, the timid, and unappreciated, struggling people who have to strive for support and respect. For them, may your kingdom come. In the dynamic of your love, may your realm become a reality for them all. Amen. Amen. Yes. 
extinguish this chalice, but not the fire of commitment. You go out into the world with that on your mind. Amen?